Today we're switching now to investment strategy for a close look at some of the overseas opportunities. Nathan Bell from Peters McGregor joins us live in the studio. And look, as as we pushed above 6,000 and beyond, and really it might come into question today, many people wondering whether or not there are greater opportunities offshore, or in fact, you know, people have already been taking advantage, if you believe a lot of the anecdotal evidence at least. I mean, are you finding... You've got a whole world to scour, I guess, Nathan, so there must be some opportunities. <laughs> you hope so. <laughs> Look, you think it would be easy when you're only trying to put a portfolio of 20 to 30 stocks together, but uh, the problem is it's just asset prices across the globe are very high, and anything that I think is well understood, the growth story is well understood, it pays a decent dividend, all that stuff's trading at nosebleed levels, and in fact, the US market at the moment is actually trading on the highest level ever on some ratios. Mm. Now, you can talk about the difference in composition between some mm. of the leading stocks today versus 1929, but nonetheless, it, it tells you that it's actually more difficult out there than you might think. I know you've been looking at ETFs as well, and, and they sort of do very well in good times, but in bad times, those losses are obviously amplified. So there's been a bit of talk lately that ETFs obviously are holding a lot of risk, and a bit of concern and fear sort of, I guess, coming up around those ETFs. What's your take on this going forward? Is there a potential crisis in the ETF space? So I don't think ETFs on their own can create the crisis. I just mm. don't think there's enough leverage in them. Uh, but I think you talked about it is, is the accentuating of a of downward spiral. I think it's definitely going to help on mm. that side of things. If you're a long-term investor, you probably look forward to that. Uh, but I think that will scare a lot of people who think they're buying into a very safe investment. But, but you'd have only... to get a downward spiral in markets in order to see that. Exactly. Like exactly. And they haven't been tested before, right? These are mm. such new products that we haven't really seen in 2009. They weren't really around, so we haven't seen them how they've worked before in that environment. Mm. But the bottom line is valuation, and uh, one of the most reliable forecasts I look at is that the S&P is forecast to do minus 4% over the next seven years. So you don't really want a broad exposure to a large index like the US, and you really need to be very selective about what you own. Mm. But, I mean, there's no doubt that there are growing popular instruments in terms of people's portfolio. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't see them going away, but do you see them... How do you see them fitting in a portfolio alongside active managers? I mean, are they something that could potentially complement each other because you're having taken different strategies? Yeah, I think it's quite interesting. We tend to think of them as passive instruments, but a lot of people are actually using them as, as active strategies. Right. Mm. And the turnover on some of these products is like 800% a year. So clearly they're not being used by long-term investors to get broad exposure. They're being used exactly for the reasons you suggest. Uh, we talked last week about European banking exposure. Mm. It might be a sensible way to use them. But I think the main, the main thing, you've just got to make sure you know exactly what you're buying because uh, particularly in the US they're actually a lot more complicated than mm. what people think and you're not actually getting the exposure uh, that you actually think you're getting in these international markets. Well, in what way? Because people obviously say they often distort the market because basically people are investing in these huge big names but the fund they're not looking at the fundamentals of these companies, they're just kind of going for big names in those ETFs. So, so in what way? Just elaborate on what you were saying. Yeah, so for example, uh, if you go into some of like an Indian market and you look at some of the businesses, uh, a lot of the actual exposure is US because mm. these big Indian businesses actually have most of their businesses in the US. Mm. So you actually think you're buying an Indian exposure and actually what you're buying is just another exposure in the US. Now, I just don't think people are actually doing the due diligence to actually look underneath the hood and see where those exposures are because I think the people creating the ETFs have actually done it all for you when really they haven't. They've just badgered as something mm. and underneath it's actually something quite different. Is that Indian market something that you do like exposure to at the moment? Is it something that you have been looking at? Yeah, so we own uh, what you might, it's sort of like a listed investment company where uh, the listed investment company essentially owns uh, a bunch of private businesses that you can't buy uh, on the market. Mm. So we really like this exposure, but it's listed in Toronto. Uh, so it's a little bit <laughs> confusing, but um, the, the valuations in the year are actually at the moment very high, but I think over the next 10 or 15 years, you're going to see um, it catch up a lot with China. We're going to see by 2020, more Indians should have more mobile phones than in China, mm. uh, and they're really starting to catch up on the internet, and we're only at the very, very beginning of that. Because you're, you're quite heavily invested in, in internet providers and cable TV around the world, not just in India? Uh, no, so we're in Latin America where internet penetration rates are only about 35%, so about half what they are in the Western world. So you've got that great growth runway, and China, uh, you know, India is even way behind on that. The problem is with India, the actual market is actually quite small, and so you get these big global capital flows that come in and out, and so you get very high valuations at the moment, but when that capital comes out, that's when you actually need to be looking to get in. So it's sort of big momentum wave, I guess, like we're seeing in the US. I mean, the question's always raised about some of these sorts of places to invest, you know, governance, transparency. Yeah. See those sorts of issues. I mean, are, are they are there problems in that area? Uh, absolutely. Corruption is rife and Modi's been trying to do everything he can to try and tighten this part of it up. Uh, I think the government only takes in about 10% um, 
of GDP as revenue in taxation yeah. versus something like 30 or 35 percent in the Western world. So that gives you a clue about how bad it is. Uh, and the reason we own this uh, Toronto listed company is, is because we trust the management. And uh, just as an example, they own 48 uh, percent of the Bangalore Air International Airport, which has 22 million visitors going through annually at the moment. By 2030, that should be 60 million. Um, now, the question to ask is how did they get that asset? Mm. Um, you know, you probably don't actually want to know what goes on behind <laughs> the scenes, but the fact is they've got it. It's a great asset. And they're the sort of people we want to do business with. Do you with. think Modi has done a good job making India more investable, though? Mm. Uh, I think he has. He's friendly, I guess. Yeah, he's taken on a lot of measures. It's just very tough. You've got a population of a billion people, and most mm. of them are dirt poor. Mm. So to make the changes, you can't expect him to do them in one or two years. Mm. Uh, they've done some amazing things in India. They've got a national database which you access with a thumbprint or a retina scan. Now, no other country has that, so they're actually leading in that technology. I mean, you wouldn't think that sort of yeah. stuff, but that's going to give access to uh, borrowing and money to buy homes, build businesses, and all that's yet to come. That's only getting started. Ingrid mentioned, you know, you guys have interest in uh, ISPs and, and cable providers. It's, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of the, the talk around you know, th that sort of area of the market at the moment is, is one not exactly overflowing mm. with optimism. Mm. So, again, it's probably a good idea of where uh, we are actually finding value is because we think the businesses are somewhat misunderstood. Mm. Uh, everyone's focused on the cable TV part of these businesses mm -hmm. and they probably do profit margins of, uh, you know, about 35, 40 per cent. Uh, because they've got to pay like Disney and all the content providers for the mm. money, but they also deliver the internet. And basically, in the US and all of these places, they're an absolute monopoly. You don't mm. actually get a choice. They're the only people you can buy the internet from. So if you need fast broadband, you've got to pay for them. And the incremental margin for a broadband customer is like 99%. Mm. And you don't see that advertised in an annual report for obvious <laughs> reasons. Um, but it just shows you the internet business is, you know, at least double as good as what the cable TV business is. And I just don't think that's well is understood. The, is the concern there, though, that it's going to, you know, that margin is going to attract competition and suddenly you're actually investing at peak margin mm. versus the, the outlook which perhaps somewhat crimped. So if we take the US for example, uh, like it's by pure fluke of history that uh, the cables they ran in, dug into the ground decades ago for cable TV just turned out to be the absolute best way mm. to deliver a broadband. It wasn't you know, predetermined. Um, but if you want to compete, you've actually got to lay that cable. And Google earlier uh, this year and last year started trying to roll out fibre. And in the end, they just gave up. It was just so expensive to lay it and then trying to get customers to sign up. So that's why we really like it. Actually having stuff in the ground um, is a real competitive advantage. Are you looking more and more at emerging markets more broadly? I mean, we know when a global economy tends to do better, emerging markets tend to do better. <laughs> as well. Is this somewhere where you're watching, just speaking of India? Yeah, I'd just say as an example, we talked last week about the Chinese technology stocks that we own. Yeah. Five or six years ago, one, we would never have heard of these businesses, mm. and two, they weren't listed either. And the third thing we really like about these businesses is that they've got uh, founders who run the business. That's really important for us. Mm. We talk about things like corruption. Mm. Um, so we want good managers with skin in the game looking after us as shareholders because you tend to go to a lot of these places. There's profits there, but they don't seem to come back to the mm. shareholders for some reason. Uh, so I think these markets are becoming much more investable as the quality mm. of the business is getting better. Seeing as we just touched on uh, China and tech stocks, we spoke about it last week. Uh, $25 billion in, uh, in singles day, Alibaba. I mean, this is just, this is extraordinary. So I know it's meant to rival the US's Black Friday uh, sales, but, you know, as a construct, Jack Ma, Alibaba, it just seems to be genius. Mm. Yeah, well, I think there's a huge trend there. So we own their competitor, JD.com. Uh, I haven't seen their numbers yet. Um, so, so it's not just Alibaba platform, it's across, it's across China, is it? All providers and, so it's and really, marketplaces? Yeah, so it's really the, the two big players are Alibaba and JD. Mm -hmm. And JD is invested in the supply chain, whereas Alibaba is really like the eBay. Yeah. So it's just you know, cutting, uh, clipping the tick on the way through. Uh, but internet commerce in China, uh, the amount of online transactions is something like 50 times higher mm. in China than it is in the US, simply because people have never had all those years to have the network of stores yeah. to be built. Uh, so it's actually much more popular in China than it is in the US and essentially we're riding that wave. Yeah, interesting stuff. Nathan Bell, really appreciate your time on the program. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll get you across all the latest corporate and political stories of the day. Stay with us.